This lecture is on general equilibrium. Okay. I want to clarify the difference between partial equilibrium, which is what we've been doing mostly so far, and general equilibrium. So in partial equilibrium, we look at one market at a time. So for example, we might look at just the market for corn. And we'll have a demand curve and a supply curve, et cetera. When we're looking at that market, what we have been implicitly assuming is that everything that's happening in other markets kind of is, is hold fixed. Like there's no changes in the prices of other markets. So for example, if we're looking at the market for corn, we're assuming that there haven't been any changes in uh, you know, the market for wheat. So no shocks to demand, no shock supply, no price changes in the market for wheat. Um, likewise, we've assumed that there's no changes in the price of complementary products for corn, like butter. Okay? So we basically assume everything else is held fixed. We're just going to look at this one market in question. Now, that type of analysis can actually be a little bit misleading because markets are interdependent. In fact, even if you assume there aren't any shocks in these other markets for complements or substitutes, it might be, and we'll actually look at this a little closer in just a moment, that when there's a shock in the market for corn, that's going to impact uh, the demand or supply in another market, like the market for wheat, which is then going to feed back into the initial market that we were looking at, corn. And so if you ignore these interdependencies between the markets, then you might actually get misleading conclusions from your analysis. So the plan for today is to look at general equilibrium analysis, which accounts for these interdependencies. Okay, specifically, general equilibrium analysis is the study of markets that takes into account all cross-market influences to arrive at a set of prices that simultaneously equates both demand and supply in every market that we're looking at, in many markets at the same time. Okay. So let me give you an example. Okay, there's an Energy Policy Act of 2005. This is a legislation that required that biofuels be used in gasoline. Okay, so you might know now, if you go to a pump to fill your car, that it might say that up to 10% of what you're actually putting in your car is ethanol rather than traditional gasoline, right? It's a blend of ethanol and traditional gasoline, okay? The policy required that at least 4 billion gallons of ethanol be used in gasoline blends in 2006. And by 2012, it had to have increased to 7.5 uh, billion gallons, okay? Now, these were assumed to be binding minimums meaning that in absence of these regulations or these laws, uh, gasoline producers would not put as much ethanol in their gasoline mixture, right? Because of that, as expected, the, this mandate, this new requirement, increased the demand for corn. It's not increasing demand for people who want to you know, eat more corn, but it has this other use of corn to be processed into ethanol, which is then put in gasoline. And this requirement is increasing the demand for corn from gasoline producers, which increases the demand for corn overall. Okay, and this is going to increase the price of corn, but we're going to see that the prices in some other markets that cannot be used to make ethanol, things like wheat, rice, and soybeans, are indirectly impacted. Okay, so this is where things get really interesting. As the price of wheat rises, that's going to feed back into the initial market which we cared about for corn, right? As the price of a substitute goes up, then the price of corn is going to go up as well as people switch back from wheat to consuming corn. Okay, so let's look at the market for corn and wheat in general equilibrium. This slide here shows two graphs, one for the corn market, which is shown on the left, and one for the wheat market, which is shown on the right. On the left graph, the price of corn is shown on the vertical axis, and the quantity of corn is shown on the horizontal axis. The graph on the right is similar. On the vertical axis, we have the price of wheat, and on the horizontal axis, we have the quantity of wheat. Now, I want to be very clear about what I mean by the inverse demand for corn and the inverse demand for wheat. 
This inverse demand function for corn shown here on this left graph, that is the demand for corn assuming this initial price of wheat, right? Because corn and wheat are substitutes, if you were to change the price of wheat, that would shift the inverse demand for corn either left or right. Likewise, this inverse demand function for wheat is the inverse demand function for a particular price of corn. Okay, so we're in general equilibrium. Inverse demand for corn correctly reflects the price of wheat in the market for wheat, and the inverse demand for wheat correctly reflects the price of corn. So now let's look at what happens when we shock the corn market with this law change. So let's look at this. We have this shift in demand as gasoline producers demand more corn for ethanol. That's gonna increase the overall demand for corn. And as we can see, as the demand shifts to the right, it's going to lead to a higher price of corn and a larger quantity of corn being transacted in the market for corn. This inverse demand for corn is the inverse demand under the new law change, but still reflecting the original price of wheat. So the shock happens to the corn market, price increases. Let's think about what that implies for the market for wheat. Well, this inverse demand curve for wheat was the inverse demand curve assuming the original price of corn. As the price of corn goes up, if we assume wheat is a substitute, then some consumers are going to want to switch from consuming corn for food to wheat. And that's going to increase the demand for wheat, shift the inverse demand curve to the right, which is going to lead to an increase in the price of wheat, as well as an increase in the quantity of wheat transacted. Okay. But we're not done yet. Let's go back to the market for corn. Remember, this inverse demand curve here reflected the law change that required ethanol be used in gasoline, but did not reflect the change in the price of wheat. It still reflected this original price of wheat. As the price of wheat goes up, that's going to increase the demand for corn further, shifting it to the right, which is going to lead to an even higher price of corn. Okay. Now remember, this inverse demand for wheat here was assuming this price of corn after the law change this PC2, but it did not reflect the additional change from these sort of stacked interactions. Okay. So this inverse demand curve for wheat does not reflect the new, even higher price of corn. If we were to draw the new inverse demand for wheat that reflects the new, even higher price of corn, it would be even further to the right. And I can see as the price of wheat goes up even further, that's going to increase the demand for corn further, and so on. And eventually, you know, these back and forth interactions will peter out and eventually you'll arrive at a new general equilibrium where in both markets the inverse demand curve reflects the price in the other market. Okay, so the new equilibrium after the price change is given by this point here in the market for corn and this point here in the market for wheat. Now I want to point out that these interdependencies have a big impact even if you're just looking at the market for corn, suppose you don't care what happens in the market for wheat. If you were to do what we've been assuming so far in this class and assume that the price of wheat did not change, it would imply that this regulation would raise price and quantity from this initial point here to this point here. But because of these interdependencies, the law change is actually going to have an even larger increase in the price of corn and quantity of corn than we would predict if we were just using partial equilibrium analysis. What I want to encourage you to do is if you found this a little bit unclear, to re-watch the last few minutes of this video where I go over the graph. So just to summarize again, due to the demand side links between substitutes in general equilibrium, this law change had an even larger impact on prices and quantities than would be predicted if someone just used partial equilibrium analysis, which ignored these dependencies between the markets for corn and the market for wheat.